While we've seen suicide rituals in Imperial China, ancient Mayan culture, and some might say in organized religious extremists in today's world, one that sticks out in my mind is the act of seppuku in feudal Japan, which consisted of the disembowelment of oneself. It would see a samurai slash open his own stomach, usually with a small blade, known as a tanto, before his head was hacked off by an assistant. In the western world, seppuku would become known as harakiri, but for the purpose of this video, I'll be referring to it as seppuku. Seppuku wasn't just the brutal carving of one's own flesh though, it was a complicated process on both a spiritual and emotional level, where it was believed that the spirit of a person resided in the pit of the stomach, and so by slitting open the stomach, it allowed for the spirit to leave the vessel. It was also considered to be one of the bravest ways a man could end his life, and so it would not be looked upon with sadness or with derision. The slashing of the stomach by one's own hand was such an honour in fact, that it would be an almost holy death, reserved only for the samurai. But like I said, seppuku was complicated because of the levels in which it was built upon, as well as the implications it could leave for the surviving members of one's family. For example, if a samurai screamed or cried during his self disembowelment he would dishonour his family and cause them to suffer humiliation long after his death. Furthermore, if he was not modest or brave during his seppuku, he would be remembered from that day forth as a coward and an embarrassment, regardless of his achievements in life. Political expectations also played a huge role in seppuku, for if a samurai surrendered to his adversary instead of committing suicide, he could face the disdain of his peers who would label him as weak or a coward. If he was politically inclined, he could face the loss of support and funding as well as potential usurpation, depending on his rank. In the book of Hagakure, a spiritual Japanese book for warriors, there exist some tales of samurai making a scene during a seppuku, some of whom refused to do it after being ordered. These samurai would bring about the utmost disgrace upon themselves and their families and would be forcibly decapitated anyway. By the Edo period, seppuku wasn't just something conducted on a losing battlefield, it had become an almost grand ceremony that would feature strict customs and rules. Those forced into seppuku would be made to wear a white kimono and in silence would kneel on a white cushion with the utmost formality. This meant that they were to show no emotion, no remorse or regret and not beg for an alternative fate. The entire process was quite automatic in that everyone knew their roles. The witnesses would know to stand discreetly to one side, meanwhile an assistant known as a kaisha kunin would stand to the left of the samurai. The role of the kaisha kunin was to prevent the samurai from experiencing too much pain by fatally striking him. You see, contrary to what many believe, seppuku in the ceremonial sense wasn't exactly suicide but more so assisted suicide, as the samurai didn't die from his own self-inflicted wound. Once the samurai had cut himself from one side to the other, the kaisha kunin would step in and strike the death blow by slicing his sword across the samurai's neck. The idea wasn't to send his head rolling though, for this would be considered to be of the highest disrespect and would bring about shame not only for the deceased but also for the kaisha kunin. The proper execution of this death blow would be to strike the samurai's neck with enough force to sever the spine but with enough restraint to leave the head attached. Given the difficulty of this feat, the role of the kaisha kunin was only given to those who possessed a masterfulness with the sword. In the book of Hagakure, the retainer Yamamoto Sunitomo wrote, From ages past, it has been considered an ill omen by samurai to be requested as kaisha kunin. The reason for this is that one gains no fame even if the job is done well. Further, if one should blunder, it becomes a lifetime disgrace. One of the main points of this was to restore or to protect the honour of the warrior who was committing suicide, but if the head was removed from the neck, then the samurai would certainly not look dignified in death. With this in mind, the kaisha kunin would aim to leave a small part of the throat or the neck still attached. This way, the head of the deceased samurai could both metaphorically and literally rest in his own hands. A wooden table would be brought to the samurai during the moments before his death, 
that contained sake, a piece of paper, some writing utensils, and a kazuka, which was the blade in which samurai used to disembowel themselves in this ceremony. It's understood that if he preferred, the samurai could use his own sword. With the writing utensils, the samurai were encouraged to write a jisei, or a death poem, and these were considered to be a very essential element of the seppuku ceremony, because a person on the brink of death was said to have been blessed with an insight into the nature of life and death that was otherwise closed off to them. By getting them to write their thoughts down, the survivors would hope to garner a better understanding of the meaning of life. The poem, though, couldn't have samurai spouting salty, butthurt messages about how they'd been wronged in life, for this was seen as undignified, though it didn't stop a few of them from trying. In fact, to even speak about the impending death in a corporeal means was considered uncouth. The poems were also often how a samurai would be remembered, which is why some of the writings are so profound. On the battlefield though, there wasn't always time to go through with this whole ceremonial process of seppuku, so oftentimes, Samurais would just slash their bellies right there and then on the battlefield, so as to avoid capture by the enemy, and to avoid the disgrace of having to admit defeat to their enemy. Dying by their own hand in this sense was far more favourable than dying by the enemy hand. In the case of Minamoto Yoshinaka, he was said to have put his sword in his mouth and jumped from his horse. Others have been noted to have thrown themselves from cliffs, or simply slit their own throats, on other accounts on the battlefield, there wasn't always a kashikunin available, and so samurai who were committing seppuku would have to act as their own executioner. Sometimes with the absence of a small blade, they would plunge their entire katanas into their guts and slice horizontally. The samurai would then remove the blade from his stomach and stab himself in the throat, all fall from a standing position with the blade positioned against his heart. Seppuku was committed for a variety of different reasons, for one, many samurai committed suicide following the death of their lord. A legend exists that at the end of the Genpei War between the Taira and Minamoto clans, the Taira general Tomomori decided to end his life when he realised the battle was lost. He summoned his brother to help him into a heavy suit of armour, and then hand in hand, they jumped into the sea. Having seen this, many other samurai donned heavy armours and jumped in after their general some of them carrying heavy objects to ensure they sank with him. Other accounts of seppuku included killing oneself because of their indignation at a certain circumstance, or in protest to something that had taken place in which the samurai absolutely detested. Others would commit suicide simply to make a point when all other forms of making this point had been exhausted. One famous account of this was where Hirate Kiyohide the man who was tasked with looking after the young, unruly Oda Nobunaga realised he could not control Nobunaga's outrageous behaviour. So he wrote a letter explaining Nobunaga's folly before killing himself in hopes that the young lord would change his ways. His death would have such an impact on Nobunaga that he did indeed change his ways and went on to become the unifier of Japan. Another more dastardly form of seppuku existed for some really hardcore samurai who would go as far as to add a second vertical cut to the original horizontal cut. It was known as Jumanji Giri, and it would contain no kaishikunin to put an end to the suffering. Instead, the samurai committing this horribly painful suicide was expected to bear his suffering quietly until he bled to death. Women were also known to commit a ritualistic suicide, usually the wives of the samurai who had committed seppuku, or the wives of samurai who had brought about dishonour. Some women who belonged to the families of samurai on the losing side of the battle would commit suicide to avoid capture. They would cut the arteries of their neck with a single stroke, but before doing this, they would tie their knees together so that they would be found in a dignified position. Invading armies who had killed their enemies and ventured into the towns would not be surprised to find the lady of their enemy's house seated alone, facing away from the door in a pool of her own blood. There exists a particularly compelling tale of a European's witnessing seppuku for the first time in 1868. Eleven French sailors entered a Japanese town named Sakai without permission, and their presence called distress and panic amongst the locals. Samurai were dispatched to investigate, but were heavy-handed with the French sailors, which would result in an altercation. 
the sailors were subsequently killed by the samurai. A French ambassador would protest against the wrongful killing of his fellow countrymen, and he was paid compensation by the Japanese authorities for the misfeasance of the samurai. The samurai in question were scolded for their cold-blooded murder, and forced into committing seppuku to atone for the loss of life. Each samurai committed the ritualistic disembowelment before the French ambassador, but upon seeing it, the Frenchman was so shocked and sickened that he begged for the samurai to be pardoned. As a result of his wish, the remaining samurai were spared. Seppuku as an execution was abolished in 1873, when imperial rule returned to Japan. However, there have since been many accounts of voluntary seppuku as late as the 1970s, where author Yukio Mishima and one of his followers, Masakatsu Morita, performed the suicide ritual. Their goal was to spur the Japanese self-defense forces into staging a coup d'etat, and Yukio Mishima went as far as to impale himself and slice across his own stomach. His second though, the 25-year-old Masakatsu Moria, failed to decapitate him, even after swinging the blade three times. His head was finally severed by Hiroyasu Koga, a former kendo champion, but even he wasn't able to slice Yukio Mishima's head, in the traditional sense, by leaving just enough flesh to keep the head intact. Having failed to kill Yukio, Masakatsu attempted to perform seppuku himself, but could not cut deep enough into his own flesh for the wound to be fatal. He signalled for the kendo champion Hiroyasu Koga to behead him as well, which he complied with. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's video, then please do give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to comment down below. If you haven't already, then hit the subscribe button for more content just like this. Before I sign off, you'll remember that I said that samurai would often write poems before they committed suicide, poems that were to grant an insight into life and death. Well, consider yourself super enlightened by feasting your eyes on some of these real life samurai poems written moments before their death. Until the next time guys.